Hello, thank you. I'm very grateful to Lucy and Mary to um, pull us all together under this umbrella of curiosity and learning. And I feel like we're actually all learning this together because we've all been on the standard Australian diet for a very long time. And so we, we've got a lot of learning to do together. Um, now my interest in mental health and metabolic health has come about because of my son. My son has epilepsy. And so that took me on a journey to learn about brain health. First of all, though, I'd like to acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet here, the um, Ghana people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and future and extend that respect to emerging leaders as well. And I'd also like to acknowledge that they are they have had 60,000 years of caring for our land and I think that they still have a lot to teach us and we have a lot to learn. Now, I'm not used to public speaking and so I hope that I can bring a little bit of laughter and humour to this. Um, and um, I also want to help connect dots. Connect dots, it's not just about weight loss. What's going on metabolically inside our body is actually helping our mental health. And that's why I'm interested. So what is metabolic health? Metabolic health is the basic building blocks of every cell within our body. It's how we actually make our cells and how our cells repair themselves. And they do this on an ongoing basis all the time. So we need to give them the building bo blocks that they need. So essential fatty acids, which actually it's really hard to find in amongst plants. Um, we also need to help um, uh, our, our basic hormones and, and help eliminate waste products. We all begin as a single cell and uh, then we just divide. I'm not quite sure how medicine divided us into different parts of the body, the brain, the liver, the kidney, and did it so elaborately, so, such that we have to send people along to see different specialists all the time. I mean, really, it's all the same cells, isn't it? We should be able to look after them. So what's mental health? Well, WHO um, describes it as a state of mental well-being that enables people to cope with stresses of life, realise their abilities to learn, work well and maintain fulfilling relationships. <coughs> so the thing that took me into this was the brain. I'm fascinated by brains because my son's brain was broken and I didn't know what was going on and every doctor that I took him to, I'd say to a neurologist, why has he got epilepsy? Why has he got intellectual disability? Why has he got autism? And they'd say, it doesn't matter, just take the drugs. And I found that the drugs would often make him worse and I needed to understand it. So as his mother, I'm not just responsible for his brain, I'm responsible for my brain to look after his brain. So that's why I'm here, that's why this is important. I want to look after him for as long as possible, longevity, is really important to me. So, the brain is 60% fat. You know, <laughs> how did we get our fat on the standard Australian diet? I don't know. Um, the function of the brain is to detect danger and take us away from it, but you all know that. You know, that's what anxiety is, right? So we just have to prepare, um, look after our, our brain to keep us as safe as possible as well. It's not fully formed until 25 years of age. But then we have neuroplasticity as well. So even when we think that we've got a fully formed brain, it can still change. I find that fascinating. Um, it represents 2% of our body, but it uses 20% of the body's energy. Again, like what's going on up here? It's pretty amazing, right? 25% um, of the body's cholesterol resides within our brain. So <laughs> what happens when we try and lower our cholesterols? And so every time that I see somebody on the, sorry, a statin, I ask them, do you really need this? And what's it doing to you? Um, so, how do we think well when our cells are broken? Why am I interested? I'm interested because of epilepsy. Now this is what's going on inside my son's brain all the time. He has background epileptic activity all the time. He has broken cells. Again, I wanted to know why. In the 20 years that I've had Liam in my life, um, the classification have, of epilepsy has changed. He's had a diagnosis that it's genetic, but still nothing seems to be 
changing in terms of how to treat it. And that's what I find frustrating. Here he is. He is my reason. He is almost my everything. <laughs> You'd think he was an only child. He's got three brothers. <laughs> um, but we're all, we all just so, feel so blessed to have him in our lives. My uh, third son uh, quoted to me one day when I was picking up, up from school. He said, Mum and Dad, you guys are the luckiest people in the world. You know, you've got three sons who are fast runners. And he said, and then along came your gift child. So <laughs> Liam is our gift child. He teaches us what's actually really important in life. And what's important in life is community and trying to help yourself be as healthy as possible. Um, so I actually think that I was probably insulin resistant when I was pregnant with him. So of course that's, you know, another mother blame thing that, you know, we all have happening. I also dropped him on his head, but you know, <laughs> <it's just laughs> he had his first seizure at three. Um, and, and then ever since then, he's had every sort of seizure that I can imagine. And um, when people ask me what sort of seizures he's got, I say, well, what sort of seizures do you know about? I could probably tell you a few new ones as well. Um, I, he'd had seven different medications by the time he was five years old, old. And most of the medications actually caused really bad side effects. So, for example, carbamazepine for him turned him into a zombie. I lost my child that had this light in his eyes. And to me, that was worse than, like, it actually didn't treat the seizures anyway. Nothing has ever treated his seizures. Um, and so what we're looking at is somebody who's, we've tried every guidelines, we've tried every pathway, we've tried every conventional therapy. None of them have worked. So ketogenic therapy, uh, ketogenic diet was prescribed for him by Ingrid Sheffer. I just couldn't get my head around it at that time. And I wish I could, and so now my, my reason for wanting, what I'm wanting to do hypnosis for is that I actually, I'm, I'm learning to be a hypnosis therapist, I'm wanting to help people understand ketogenic diets earlier, that it's actually changing the cells and so that you've got the possibility of actually getting in there. I don't know, you know, how many people it's going to be effective for, but it's effective for a lot. Um, he actually just wants people to like him. And yet he doesn't know how to make friends. He doesn't know how to keep friends. So again, that's my purpose in life. Epilepsy is really common, but it's really poorly understood. 4000 BC, it was, it was uh, a recognised condition. It's been written about. So 50 million people worldwide, 250,000 people in Australia. A third of people with epilepsy have refractory epilepsy, which means that it's not under control. That's a lot of people living a half-life. Um, parents of people, uh, parents of kids with epilepsy have the risk, they know about these sort of things, they know about sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. Every time they kiss their child goodnight at, at night, they know that their child might not wake up. And the other thing about it is there's a three times higher risk of death. It's actually a really serious illness, but not many people know about that. So there's a stigma attached to it. There are still countries around the world where people are exercised, people are killed because they're having seizures, people are imprisoned because people don't understand it. Um, people, everybody with epilepsy wants to know why. A third of the people diagnosed, they never get full control. I just can't imagine, you know, where are these people? I think I know where they are. I think they're all hiding at home because they just, they're too frightened to go out. I've had, I've had patients of mine come to me and say things like their neurologist said, adult up, you don't have cancer. And I just can't imagine what that would feel like. So I think people end up feeling hopeless and helpless. Ketogenic diet, 100 years of good, strong evidence. And again, you know, just that is, to me, that's profound. So Professor Ingrid Sheffer in the Melbourne Brain Centre prescribed that for Liam when he was five, but because I had another three kids and you had to be admitted to hospital, we would have had to stay in Melbourne for a couple of weeks in hospital. I just couldn't see how I could make it happen. Now, I would have made it happen. If I could have done anything to change that, I don't know whether it would have made a difference, but anyway, <laughs> I'm still beating myself up. Um, so the Charlie Foundation is a great online um, 
presence and you can go and get more information if you wanted to know about childhood epilepsies and how the ketogenic diet can turn it around. Women's and Children's Hospital actually offer it um, and I think it's fairly good but I don't really know. And so let's just take a jump. Me as a GP. Um, so that was all happening in the background. I was still working. I was basically for 25 years monitoring my diabetic patients, my patients with fatty liver, my patients with um, insulin resistance. I was monitoring them getting worse because I was just giving, using the standard you know, guidelines and standard practices. And it was actually pretty depressing. People were going blind, people were losing limbs, people were getting infections. And then um, Nicole Moore, <laughs> Nicole Moore and I were working together and she'd stop me in the corridor and she'd say, Carolyn, look what I'm doing to these people. Look at the turnaround in their haemoglobin A1C. And I'd say, what are you doing? She'd go, low carb, come along to the Gold Coast conference with me. So I did. And then it's like light bulb after light bulb after light bulb, you know, all the, all the greats in the area talking about it and you're kind of like, oh my God. What have I been doing? But um, it, was, it was Georgia Eads um, at Diagnosis Diet, her online um, training program in nutritional <laughs> mental health that just kind of sparked my interest in then starting to go, well, you know, this can be used for mental health. It can be used for people who've suffered from anxiety and depression and, and um, some people with bipolar are getting better on it and, um, you know, schizophrenia autism, you just kind of go, this is amazing. I just got so excited. And then, of course, you do it, you have to do it on yourself at the same time, don't you? It's like, I don't know if anybody else has listened to Matthew Phillips, who's a, a neurologist in New Zealand. He actually studied and spent some time here. But um, he says he would never put his patients with Alzheimer's through a three-day fast without himself doing it. And it's, it's brilliant to watch him talk as well. So of course I did the CGMs, I did it at the same time as Nicole and Lorraine, we talked all about it and it just, it just told you what was going on inside your own body. And um, I'm just watching Rochelle Martin and Nicole and Sandra Palazzo just change lives. And I just think it's fabulous. Because it is, it's food therapy. It, it's, you know, doctors, we, we go along with you, but it's food therapy. Love it. So now I feel inspired. God, I'm 60 and I feel like I've got so much more to, to do with my medical degree. You know, I've got to do things differently. So anyway, and mental health guidelines. We do have to follow conventional therapy. So, you know, and it works for a lot of people. But for the people that it's not working for, that's when we go and we try something different. Um, I have to follow these guidelines. You can see they're not confusing at all, are they? <laughs> so, are our guidelines working? Well, if they're working, <laughs> wouldn't the statistics be getting better? So, 20% or 4.8 million Australians had a mental or behavioural condition, an increase from 18% in 2014. One in five Australians aged 16 to 85 experienced mental health disorders. 13% increase in mental health conditions and substance use in decades. So why aren't we seeing improvements? We're putting a lot of money into this, right? You know, all this online stuff. So I found this fascinating. Mental health, 16 to 24 year old age group, almost 50% of young women have a mental health condition. I just felt this thought to myself, what the heck is going on? They're all vegetarian. Yeah, they are all vegetarian. Yeah, <laughs> like I was sadly at that point in time. Yeah. Oh my God, we've got to get into schools, don't we? Yeah. Lots of hopes. Uh, so, uh, what about metabolic health conditions? Are they getting better? We all know they're not, are they? You probably had other people talk to you about this today already. Everything's getting worse, despite better and better drugs, right? <laughs> what we're doing is not working, so we need to stop and think about it. We need to get into wellbeing SA. <laughs> um, everything's getting worse, mental health conditions are getting worse, metabolic conditions are getting worse. Continuing to do the same thing and expect a different outcome? Isn't that insanity? <laughs> 
Could there be one common pathway? Mental health conditions, metabolic health conditions. So that's where my book comes into it. Christopher Palmer, oh my God, amazing. Um, he says, the risk factors are the same. We all know this, you know, it's, it's not earth shattering, is it? Diet, exercise, smoking and other substance abuse, sleep, we all know we need the sleep, you know, the other things like your genes and your gut microbiome, your social and family connections, risk factors are all the same. So what does epilepsy have in common with mental health conditions? I told you Liam has epilepsy, he has intellectual disability, he has autism, he has, I'm sure he has depression at different times as well. Um, 20 to 40 percent of children with epilepsy also have autism and intellectual disability and ADHD. Oh yeah, Liam's definitely got that. <laughs> Depression coexists with, with epilepsy, 55 percent. Third, suicide attempts occur before they've been diagnosed with epilepsy. Six-fold increase in bipolar disorder, nine-fold increase in schizophrenia, so there we're getting crossovers. 30 percent of autistic kids have epilepsy. Is there a bi-directional relationship? Well, yeah, we're seeing that. So, is there a common pathway? Could there be a common pathway if metabolic and mental health conditions coexist? Christopher Palmer says there is. So, <coughs> metabolic health conditions, we've all heard of diapression, haven't we? Where you get diabetes and you've got depression. Yeah, absolutely, anybody with chronic pain. They've also got depression, right? Um, all of these things coexist. So, have I become a zealot? <laughs> Absolutely. I bet all of you are zealots too. <laughs> um, what's going on? What's at the basis of all of this? It's our mitochondria. So what we need to do and we, do know, we already know what we need to do to look after our mitochondrial health. What are they? Oh my God, I love that little diagram there. What do they actually do? They supply energy. So you think of them in terms of they are the battery inside our cells, but they do so much more as well. They help regulate our metabolism broadly. They produce and regulate neurotransmitters. You know, how important is that for our mental health? They regulate the immune system. They maintain the, our existing cells. They make and release and respond to hormones. They create reactive oxygen species and then they clean it up. <laughs> uh, they're shapeshifters. They're involved in cell growth and differentiation. They're involved in gene expression. They also eliminate old and damaged cells. They do about everything that we need. So, if the cause is mitochondrial dysfunction, what we actually need to do in terms of our mental health and our metabolic health is mitochondrial restoration. So how do we do that? Everybody here knows you eat real food, not processed food, not sugar. You eat real food, you prioritise protein. You make sure that's top of your list. A lot of us fall into the trap, we drop our carbs first, we forget about increasing our protein. So important. We need our healthy fats. Oh my God, your brains need healthy fats. And also find out what's missing. So see somebody who can help you put the pieces of your puzzle together. Um, give your brain and our cells every building block that it needs. We need our exercise, particularly resistance training. So I used to focus on cardio and I thought that was the, the key, but in fact, the more we learn, it's actually our resistance training. We need gym work or we need Pilates or we need a good program in place. We all know we need good sleep and um, Matthew Walker's got a great book, Why We Sleep. So if you need any help, there's some really great little hacks in there. Um, you can also get him online as well. Um, you need to reduce stress. Breathe deeply, we all know about that, don't we? So things like yoga or um, <laughs> learning a wind, wind instrument, learning how to sing. Um, laughing, laughing as often as you can because it actually stimulates and, and helps your body to be healthy. Find your own passions, we all know that that helps. Love people deeply, it's very easy 
to lose track of loving and investing in our people. And sometimes it's just a matter of, of um, connecting with people. Just, you know, pick up the phone or send them a text or... Um, and we all know what happens when we don't live our life to our values. I think we've all had those moments in our lives where you kind of go, something doesn't feel right, you know, something's not happening. And sometimes it's, it's because our values have been crossed and we just need to kind of stand up and advocate for, for whatever it is that went wrong. Find your tribe. It's great to have you here. <laughs> so where to from here? Work out your individual reason why because we've all got different reasons. And it's important to have your reason. My why is longevity. I need to be here for my Liam for as long as possible. Find your team. It's got to involve a nutritionist or a dietitian. It's really important because we all get it wrong at some point in time. Get informed. Measure what you need to. It makes a difference. None of us know what we don't know, so ask questions. Be curious and kind first to your mitochondria, because they are the important things. Then be kind to yourself, be kind to everybody. Be the change. These are the people that I love to get my information from. I go to International League Against Epilepsy, and I'm always looking out for the latest. And interestingly, the latest with epilepsy is metformin. <laughs> or some of the other new diabetic drugs for epilepsy. I mean, come on, isn't it obvious? <laughs> and none of us do it alone. We all need, a, we all need help. Thank you. Thank you.